Good morning, good morning. Everybody getting ready for Christmas? I hope. I don't hear any I don't hear any bah humbugs out there. No, I did hear a bah humbug. <laughs> well, it's good to be in church this morning. This is our main Sunday morning service here at New Testament Baptist Church in Safford, Arizona. It's good to have all of you online out there with us. Bless all of you. Bless all of you that are, that are in the auditorium here. It's a, it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Please take your songbooks and turn to hymn number 108. 108. One oh eight Angels from the Realms of Glory. Let's think of the words as we sing. Angels from the realms of glory wing your flight for all the earth. Ye who sang creation story now proclaim Messiah's birth. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, once again, thank you so much. Lord, that we can gather together freely in your house still. Lord, we, we pray that you would be with us. Lord, may our heart be soft and moldable. Lord, may the Master shape us into that which you would have us to be. Lord, be with our pastor. Give him all that he needs to feed your sheep. And we'll thank you in Christ's holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> it's time, it's time. Sorry about that. It's time for a hymn history. Okay. Edmund Hamilton Sears is the author of two Christmas carols that are mirror images of each other, written 15 years apart. He was born in Sandusfield, Massachusetts on April 6, 1819, and attended Union College in Schenectady, then Harvard Divinity School. He was ordained in the Unitarian ministry and chose to devote himself to small towns in Massachusetts where he had time to study, think, and write. At age 24, he wrote, Calm on the Listening Ear, a Christmas carol based on the song of the angels in Luke, Luke 2. It proved very similar to the more famous carol he would later write. Having the same meter and theme, it can be sung to the same tune. Fifteen years later, he wrote its more <coughs> famous twin, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. It's an unusual carol in that there is no mention of Christ, no mention of the newborn babe, no mention of the Savior's mission. Sears, after all, was Unitarian. The author's only focus is the angelic request for peace on earth. Notice again the date of the hymn. It was written as the clouds of civil strife were darkening in the United States. It was written in 1849. 
setting the stage for the war between the states. We can grasp the concern that drove Edmund to write this hymn by reading a stanza now usually omitted from most hymnals. And here is the stanza. Yet with the woes of sin and strife, the world hath suffered long. Beneath the angel strain have rolled 2,000 years of wrong. And man at war and man hears not the love song which they bring. Oh, hush the noise, ye men of strife, and hear the angels sing. Edmund Sears became well known because of his hymns and books. He was awarded a Doctor of Divinity degree in 1871 and took a preaching tour of England where he was met by large congregations. He died in Weston, Massachusetts on, in January 16, 1876. Please turn in your books to page 109, hymn number 109. It came upon a midnight clear. It Prettyman has um, asked us to pray for Noah. This is uh, um, the first time that at this level it's become real public what's going on there. Um, and uh, so he says, uh, Brother Prettyman says, please pray for Noah. I flew out this week from Chicago to spend 10 days alone with Noah. He has really been struggling with daily meltdown. He doesn't deal well with transition and change, and we are in the midst of a big one. Will you pray for me that the Lord will give me such wisdom that I will know what to say, how to minister to him, how to understand what's going on in his head, to see how the enemy is attacking. We really need a big breakthrough. His mental health has, gone, has grown worse and worse. And so please remember to pray for Noah Prettyman. I have a thank you note from uh, the dailies uh, that I'll read. We would like to give you a big thank you to all who have been a part in preparing and participating in Mom's Memorial and the meal to follow. Thank you also to those who attended and supported us through our recent trials and illness, love in Christ, Gail and Mike. Mike is not here this morning, so please remember to pray for him. I assume he's just not feeling well today, so please remember to pray for him. All right, now, um, we're gonna start something here. Um, 
Um, all of the ladies are going to be given a gift. This is from Janice Wood. So guys, come on in and hand those things out, all right? All the ladies get a gift. And uh, so um, we're going to, this is from Janice Wood. We wanted to make sure that these things got handed out. There's two in the nursery, um, Lynn and um, give one to uh, Brother uh, Brother Wiley back there because uh, Karen's not here this morning. All right, they're going to go back and get a second load. Wesley, you're going to get some more, buddy? All right, here we go. There's that one. We might need some more, we might not. Susan, do you have one yet? Do we have my front yet? All right, did you get one, Selena? Okay, don't forget Rachel at the piano. She already got one? All right, forget Rachel at the piano. <laughs> oh, here comes one coming in. Mrs. Rustin came in. She gets one. Woohoo! Made it just in time. Sherry, you get one too, huh? You already got yours. Oh. All right, fine. Be that way. Mrs. Rustin does need one. Wesley, want to give one to me? There you go. Is that everybody? All right. The leftovers, do they go to men? Do they just sit there for a couple weeks and see who picks them up kind of thing? Okay, we'll do that. All right, then. And uh, so if the young ladies, if Mackenzie wants one or if Emily wants one, if the young kids want one, then they can pick one up. All right? So uh, that'll be good. Oh, we're going to give one to Emily. There we go. All right. Very good, very good. <laughs> He's not quite sure, Mom. All right, good, 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 good. All right, well, Merry Christmas from Janice Wood. She put a lot of hours into those things. She's been working on those things, I mean, I, I think since March. I don't know, a long time. So um, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully that'll be a blessing and encouragement. Every time you, you, you pull a Kleenex out of there, pray for her, okay? All right, so that'll be good, that'll be good. All right, let's see here. Christmas caroling this Tuesday night, 6 o'clock. Be here. Looking forward to it. We aren't going to, I don't think we're going to be in the, out in the cold for a long period of time. I think we're going to go to a couple, three or four different houses, and they're actually kind of spread out. So we'll actually probably only sing three or four different times, uh, but then we'll come back here to the church and have a good time of fellowship. So if you'd like to join us, please plan to do that at 6 o'clock on Tuesday night. We're going to have the Lord's Supper next week, so pray. Uh, about that, and uh, make sure that you come with your heart prepared for that. And uh, um, we're going to move the midweek service on Christmas week to Wednesday night. And so uh, we'll move the midweek service to Wednesday night. We will also move the time to 6.30. That way we can sort of take advantage of the, the Bible's Bible study, and we're going to do that on Christmas week. That will not be this week, but the following week. I hate to even announce it sometimes because we get some confusion there. So it is the week of Christmas that we're moving um, the midweek service back a couple of days, all right? And, uh, or actually just one night, from Thursday tonight to Wednesday night. So, all right, very good, very good. Everybody's kind of quiet tonight, man. Some of you are sitting out there with your eyes closed. Everybody's awake, you all right? Has it been a long week? We got a lot of things done this week. Yeah, it's been a good week. All right, we're going to open up the Word of God, so don't fall asleep, all right, until I get done preaching. Remember to pray for Noah, um, pretty men please, and um, thank you for being with us this morning. A lady was taking her daughter to church and said, you know, we have to be very quiet in church. The daughter says, I know. Mommy says, do you know why we have to be quiet? And I said, I know. She says, well, why? She says, it's because some people are sleeping. <laughs> Please turn to hymn number 117, 117. Can you imagine yourself being there in Bethlehem with the, the newborn baby, the, the, the shepherds being talked to by the angels, the heavenly hosts singing and just bowling them over, I'm sure, and then having them go and see what, what went on there in Bethlehem. 
O little town of Bethlehem, number 117. This will slow us down just a little bit. And again, we focus on the baby Jesus. What child is this? Take your Bibles, please, this morning and turn, if you will, to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 
Exodus chapter number 19. Exodus chapter number 19. We are going to actually focus on the first couple of verses of chapter 20, but uh, we're going to consider for a moment uh, God alone. God alone. Um, Exodus chapter number 19, and we are going to begin reading at verse number 18. And Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And let the priests also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds about the mount, and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people, and spake unto them. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Heavenly Father, we ask and pray that you would help us to consider for a moment your greatness, the fact that you are God and you are God alone. And Lord, there is no other God before thee, nor will there ever be at one after you. We ask and pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, and we pray, God, that you would um, get a hold of us this morning and cause us, Lord, to be lifted into your presence. We ask and pray, Lord, that um, we might know of a certainty that we have met with you today, and we pray these things in God's holy name, the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Ron was teaching Sunday school this morning, and he mentioned the fact that uh, we need to um, consider the fact that we ought to love God, and we ought to love God more. And, and he made mention of the fact that we need to, you know, look within ourselves and see where we can love God more. And to be perfectly honest, he's exactly right. But I would take that with this message this morning one step further. And I would tell you that if you think for one second that you have loved God as much as you possibly can, and you have searched within, and you have looked within, and you think, oh, no, I couldn't love God anything any more than I possibly do, do love God. If that's where you are this morning, let me encourage you to, to, to look without, that is to look to God. Because if you look to God, you will find many, many reasons to love him for which you have not yet considered. God is a glorious God. If I was to ask you a question this morning and I was to say, what is the greatest need? What is, what is the greatest need that people have in the world? What would you say? I'll let you talk back to me this morning. Salvation. The greatest need, I would, my personal, because I wrote the message, you know, and I'm thinking about it, my personal need here, what is the greatest, I think the greatest need that people have in the world is to know God. That's the greatest need. We need to know who God is. Let me ask you another question, uh, maybe the same question another way. What is the greatest need that Christians have in the church today? To know God. 
That is the greatest need that we have in church today, to know God. That we, we do not, we think we know God. We, we conclude that based on circumstances and the fact that we go to church and the fact that we read the Bible, we think that we know God. But until we know who God is, we cannot even know who we are. We don't even know what our needs are. Until we compare ourselves to something else, we don't know exactly how far short we fall of the glory of God. That bright light that Ron mentioned in Sunday school this morning, that, that, that light that shines and that blinds us, that brightness, that glory of God, we have no idea how far short we fall of that until we consider the light. God has set the standard. God God has given us the standard. He has told us here in in Exodus, and we're going to look at this in a couple of verses here at the beginning of chapter number 20. He set the standard. And let me remind you that unlike uh, the public school system, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ does not grade on the curve, okay? He knows exactly what is right and what is wrong. Um, uh, There is sort of, uh, you might even consider the Ten Commandments uh, as the handwriting on the tablet of stone, as it were, all right? He has told us what is right and what is wrong. He has told us what we should do and what we shouldn't do. The law, the law has been given. The person of the Lord Jesus Christ came and fulfilled the law, and he he fulfilled the law, not because there was some problem with the law, but because the law was perfect, and we are told that the law was perfect, and Christ fulfilled that law. The law was given to show how far short we fall, how far short we come from God and his holiness and his righteousness. And at the same time, it was given as a schoolmaster to teach us that we cannot find within ourselves any way to accomplish God's, to reach God's glory except through the mercy and grace of God who takes our sin and in its place gives us his own glory. As we hold up the law before the glory of God, the Ten Commandments sort of shine like a diamond. We, we hold it up as a, as a jeweler might take a fine piece of jewelry and put it against a black bu- backdrop, and, and you see the sparkles and the beauty in this thing. That's what we see when we look at the law. God possesses supreme authority. Supreme authority. When we see this, God is saying, that he is in charge, it's his way, literally, or the highway. Okay, we can't say that, but God can. All right? Um, Supreme authority. These are not the ten suggestions. These are the ten commandments. His holiness. We see his holiness. God decides the difference between what is holy and what is unholy. God is the one who says what is pure and what is unclean. God is the one who said, I'm on the mount, you can't come up. He puts a barrier and he says, if you cross that barrier, I'm not going to be responsible for what happens. And he is teaching his people the difference between God and man, between holiness and sin. He is also teaching us, as we consider this passage of scripture, the exclusivity of God. Okay, that is, there's no other God before us. There's only one God. He is teaching us something called the jealousy of God. And it's okay for God to be jealous. Some people say, well, jealousy is a sin. No, no, it doesn't have to be a sin. Jealousy is a sin when you want something that you can't have, something that's not yours and you want it. That's jealousy. Would you tell me what in the world God might want that that, that he doesn't have, that he doesn't deserve? There is nothing, I mean, God deserves all the praise that we can possibly give him. God deserves all of the honor that we can possibly give him. It is not sin for God to be jealous because he deserves that. That's what he is owed. He is God and he wants us to see that, to perceive that. He wants us to realize that he is holy. When we sing songs like holy, 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 it's, it's, it's not to make us feel good. It is to raise God in our hearts and minds to the place of majesty. 
We're going to talk about this next week. I'm getting ahead of myself, but in, uh, we talked, excuse me, a little bit about it Friday night at the Christmas party. But if there is not any wonder in your heart, if there's no wonder about God, you are not worshiping him. There has to be some awe. There has to be some majesty. There has to be some greatness. We have to be looking and considering God. So there's the jealousy of God. He will not tolerate the worship of any other God, nor should he. There is the spirituality of God that we see here. God is a spirit. He says, I don't want any graven images. No graven images. We have the wrath of God. God visits, we read, the iniquity of the fathers under the third and fourth generation. The wrath of God. People don't like to hear about the wrath of God. People want to hear about the love of God, and they want to, to feel as though they can do anything they want, and, and I'm supposed to go to church and feel good, and, and uh, yet God says, no, wait, if we're going to grow spiritually, we better get a, a very, very clear picture of the difference between the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. The love of God, the fact that he would visit man, the fact that he would come to man, the omniscience of God, the fact that he, God knows everything, he sees everything. The omnipresence of God, the fact that his name is Elohim and, and uh, the powerful one, he created the heavens and the earth in six days. He is omnipotent, the wisdom of God. He knows the way that we are to live and what is right and what is wrong because he designed us. He knows what we need. I learned a new word this week as I was studying, aseity, A-S-E-I-T-Y. My wife plays some word games, and sometimes we look at each other like, what in the world is that word? I don't know why you got 37 points for that, but we'll take it. Aseity is one of those new words. I didn't learn it in her word game, but I'm looking this up, and we're talking about the existence that originates from having no source other than itself, the fact that God is self-existent. I probably should have stayed with the simple stuff, right? Sufficient. He is self-satisfied. He, he doesn't need anybody or anything. That is God. That's, that's the aseity of God. I am the Lord. I am who I am, he says. We are to see, we are to observe what God is like. We will, we will do very good if we get through the first commandment this morning, because we're not going to go through all the Ten Commandments, but, but I really want to focus on this first one. Israel is camped at the base of Mount Sinai. The people cannot even touch the mount. And in that moment, God bursts forth on the scene and he gives us these 10 commandments. In that moment, in the midst of this whole thing, this, the, the fact that the, the mountain, remember we, we just read that, is on fire. It's, it's, th- th- this is a whole solemn, very th- this whole experience is, is for the children scary, for the adults very, very somber. And so we're going to see three truths. And we're going to look at the first three verses, and we're going to look at three truths. First of all, number one, in verse number one, the God who speaks. Verse number two, the God who saves. And verse number three, the God who sanctifies. This is our God, the God who speaks, the God who saves, the God who sanctifies. And first of all, we're not going to read the verse again. Well, yes, we will. And God spake all these things, God spake all these words, saying. Now, how many times in the Old Testament do you remember reading things like, you have a bunch of dumb idols that can't talk. You got a bunch of dumb idols that can't speak. They can't open their mouth. They can't answer you. And what do we see here? God speaks, and that's important. This is, a God, this is God and only God. This is it. The God who, who, who cannot speak is no God at all. The fact that God can be heard because he can speak gives more value to his word. God, Elohim, this, this majestic plural as, as such comes the warning that there is no other God. This isn't a warning from God and from Moses. This isn't a warning from Moses and from Aaron. Okay, this is, this is not a, um, uh, a warning from Moses and God. This is a warning from God. God doesn't communicate thoughts or ideas or concepts. I want you to understand that. 
That becomes vitally important as we consider the written Word of God. God does not just sort of mind meld ideas, okay? He is not just sort of trying to uh, teach us some, some basic principles. He uses words and he speaks with words. And so um, it's, not a, it's not a matter of, of communicating thoughts or ideas or concepts, words that have specific meaning. God, in other words, bears the mark of personality. We have been made in his image and in this sense, he is a person. God thinks and he feels. He's a person. He thinks, he feels, he, he chooses, he acts. God is with us and God is not silent. This is what separates God, the God of heaven, from every other God. Isaiah chapter 48 says, Remember this and show yourselves men. Bring it again to mind, O ye transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. All of the dumb gods of the surrounding nations are just that. They're just dumb gods. And in the very next verse of Isaiah 46, he says, declaring the end from the beginning. God is that God that declares, that speaks, that tells us the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. That is the God that we serve, the God of eternity. Declaring, God speaks. The end from the beginning. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. The whole implication there when, when, when you see phrases like that in Scripture is and everything in between. He's all. Sane. All of God's good pleasure will be accomplished because he is God. Whatever God says comes to pass. When he says let there be light, the light doesn't argue. Isn't that amazing? But we argue, don't we? Creation doesn't argue, but somehow we do. Isaiah 55, so shall my word, listen, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Isaiah 46, 11, yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Everything. God speaks comes to pass. This is what differentiates the God of the Bible from every other God. He speaks authoritative words that command our obedience. That is the God of heaven. His words are able to create. Can you imagine to make nothing, something out of nothing? to make something out of nothing, to create, to put a new life in you when you trusted him as your personal savior, when you trusted him to be your savior, he created new life in you. They, he's able to create, he's able to save, he is able to keep. This is the God that we serve, words that are powerful, words that are that are lucid, they're understandable, words that are infallible, that cannot be changed and will not be changed, that are always true. This is the God that we serve. His words never fail. His words are always fulfilled. If we are his people, if we are his people, then we must listen to his words. We must hear his words. We must be quick to hear and slow to speak. If we are his people, we, we are not to just be hearers of the word of God, but doers of it. God predestinated, there's that word we used last week, God predestinated that Christians would give strict attention to what God says. Do you do that? Do I do that? That's what God predestinated Christians would do. In other words, if you're not doing that, 
you need to double check whether you're even a Christian. That's what that old thought concept, that, that's where that takes us. We are to be obedient to him. And we can't claim to be his children if we don't obey him. That does not mean that we're perfect. Nobody is perfect. But listen, if you can sin and you, you get away with it and you don't care and it doesn't bother you and you really are not sure you even want to change, and, and, and if, you just, if that's the way you're living your life, folks, there's a big problem. Because salvation is not just coming forward in the church, signing a card, and, and, and then thinking that everything is all well and good and now you can go out and enjoy the, the sin in the world. Back to Exodus chapter number 20, and, and, and let, let, let me ask, has God given you ears to hear? I'm not talking about just understanding, but, but obedience. Do you even have the desire to obey is the question of the hour. This is a very serious moment. This whole thing in Exodus chapter number 20 here, the giving of the Ten Commandments, and man, this is a serious thing. This is, this is something that ought to, ought to cause our ears to, to, to just perk up a little bit here. Matthew 13, 9, who hath, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Many have ears to hear, but they are dull of hearing. Uh, they don't take it home with them. You know, as soon as they get home and turn on the ball game, uh, whatever they heard in church is going to be lost and gone forever. Do we have ears to hear? So verse number one here was, it was the fact that it is God who speaks. That's our God. Our God is the God who speaks. Our God, in verse number two, is the God who saves. He begins with this emphatic declaration in verse number two, I am, I am. God is not just a passive talking head. I am the Lord God. I am Jehovah. That's who's talking here. That's who's trying to get our attention. He is the one that is communicating with us in words. So the God of the Bible speaks. The God of the Bible saves. God is a saving God. So he says, I I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of of bondage. God is a saving God, a delivering God. He is a rescuing God. That's what God does. That's what he wants to do. He wants to rescue us from, 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 from ruin. He wants to deliver us from destruction. God, God hears their cries. It is God's nature to save. That's what the God of the Bible does. His nature is to save us. Isaiah 43, for I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Can you imagine? He says, listen, this is who I am. This is what I've done. This is, this is he says, I, I died for you. So this picture, and we're going to get there in just a moment, of the saving of Israel as a nation is a metaphor for the fact that he saved us individually. He is our savior. That's what he does. That's what he wants to do. In Isaiah 43, 11, I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no savior. In verse number 12, I have declared, there he is speaking again, I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. He said, when there was no strange God among you, when, don't you remember the days when you were not worshiping idols? When there was no strange God among you, I was there, I answered you, I spoke to you on the mount. These strange animals, these idols, these, these, uh, these uh, strange uh, um, uh, uh, idols, Gods that you have created out of your own mind, that you've worked up and made. These things can't respond to you, made out of rock and wood and, 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 and things of the earth. There's no power in these gods. And he's saying, listen, you remember when you didn't follow them. I was your God, you followed me. In other words, they are more than guilty. They are, they are absolutely, totally guilty because they should have known better. God is a saving God. Look unto me, 
and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Who hath declared, there's that word again, this from ancient time. Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. God is a saving God. The exodus by which he saved Israel, as I said, was just a metaphor of of the greater salvation, God rescuing his people. Which brings us to the New Testament, John chapter number 8. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. This is what God does. He frees us. He saves us. He gives us victory over sin. This is the doctrine of redemption. Those who he has bought, he brings entirely out of captivity. That's the promise. That's the God that we serve. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. 1 Corinthians 1, 30, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That's who God is. First Peter says, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Have you been saved is the question. Have you been brought out of your slavery to sin? Have you been set free from your love affair with this world? Those are the questions that are being asked here. We love so much that is in the world. We love songs that are in the world that that are totally contrary to Bible doctrine and the truth. And, and we, we, there are songwriters. Um, I, was, I was sitting there looking, for, for, I, I didn't think long at all. A song that, that was played when I was growing up quite a bit, that um, uh, before I was married, I was just, you know, I'd listen to it on the radio. Um, uh, it's, and, and one of the phrases in this song, I don't know who sang it, you, you, some of you may remember this, I don't know who sang it, but one of the phrases was, it's hard to belong to someone else when the right one comes along. Now, Christians listen to songs like that, and they go, oh, that's such a great love song. No, that's not a great love song. That's not a great love song. A great love song, a great love song loves the person that... that that they have, because even though that person isn't perfect, they love them because God first loved us. We, 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 we watch television shows, and, and we are exposed to sin and, 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 and nudity, and, and we're, ex, we're, we're exposed to adultery, and we don't call it that because it's so fun. We laugh at, at shows like like uh, that, that are full of, of, of wickedness and vileness. Oh, and the shows have such wonderful names. Friends. Isn't that a great name for a show? Friends. Can't watch one, you can't watch one episode of that show without seeing, without seeing adultery and fornication. You can't, watch, you can't watch it for 10 minutes without being sucked in. If you think that that is pleasing to God, then, then listen... We, we have got to get readjusted here. God is saying we have got to get back to the mount of God. We have got to get back to that place where God spoke and where we will listen. Because there is a big difference between um, um, what this world thinks and what many Christians think is okay. And they laugh at that and they think it's funny and they, they, they move forward and, and they use it as a, uh, as a, they think it doesn't matter. But it does matter to God. It matters a lot to God. God still has his Ten Commandments. 
So, there is no other salvation. There is no other name under heaven given among men. He is the God who speaks. He is the God who saves. And in verse number three, he is the God who sanctifies. Now, we could read all the way down through verse number 17 and all of these Ten Commandments. Um, uh, who shall have no other gods before me? We, we should have no other gods. So he sets, a, he sets us apart. The God who brought them out of bondage will bring them to maturity. He is going to, listen, how, how to live, how to live in a way that honors and glorifies God. That's what the Word of God is all about. The Ten Commandments are sort of God's master plan on how to live the abundant life. Now, they won't get us saved, but they certainly define what holiness is. And so this is sort of the skeleton, and, and, and the rest of the Bible puts skin and muscle on it, and, and, and this, is, this is a clearly marked path. This is a very clear, listen, this is what God expects. This is the way to live. This is a well-defined route that, that leads to blessing. When God says, thou shalt not, it is because he is trying to keep us from something that will hurt us. When God says, thou shalt, it is the path to blessing. If we follow that direction, then God is going to be able to bless us. And, 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 and here is how to enjoy God, he says. Live, live for God by following the Ten Commandments from the heart willingly and with joy. This is what the, now the, the Ten Commandments don't, don't save us, but the Ten Commandments are still there. The Ten Commandments are still valid. We had somebody, oh, this would have been 10 years ago. I've been here about 12 years. About 10 years ago, somebody came into church. Um, they came to Sunday school. They saw the, uh, it was shortly after, actually, that we had the Ten Commandments on the wall in the foyer and uh, um, uh, listed there. That, that particular uh, picture was up, and uh, they walked out of church, and the guy came back to me and told me the reason we left is because you guys have the Ten Commandments on your wall. He wanted nothing to do. And you look at that and go, well, we're not taking that. He said, I thought you were New Testament only. Listen, you can't be New Testament without the Old Testament. You can't be New Testament without the Ten Commandments. We're going to talk about that here in a second. Here's how we enjoy God. Many, many people despise the Ten Commandments. Wherefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. And that's Romans chapter number 7, folks. Romans seven twelve. you can go look at it. The Old Testament law is holy. It's good. We are not going to stop preaching the Old Testament. The law, present tense, is holy. Romans seven twelve. The law is, present tense, holy. It's a moral compass. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. 1 Timothy 1.8 says, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. So the law is good. God kept the law. God kept the law. The law was perfect. And we know that for two reasons. Not only because God kept it, which is one reason why it was perfect and proves that it was perfect, but also we know that it was perfect because God yielded to the penalty of the law. He died under the penalty of the law for your sin and mine. For those two reasons, we understand that the law was absolutely perfect as it was given. But it also taught us something about ourselves. We can't keep it. And in that capacity, it is the schoolmaster that leads us to Christ because we cannot save ourselves. So we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Romans 13, verses 8 and 9 says, O no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. So he's, even in the New Testament, we are told to fulfill the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So obedience in the New Testament is actually established by, by quoting the Ten Commandments. For example, in Ephesians chapter number 6, in discussing the home life of a family, 
The Bible talks about children obeying your parents. And it talks about the fact that it's the first commandment with promise. Guess what that's a reference to? The Ten Commandments. Okay, it goes all the way back. So obedience in the New Testament is established by the Ten Commandments. The moral law is written on our hearts the moment that we trusted Christ. Ezekiel chapter 36 says this, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness. Now that's not talking about holy water that might be sprinkled on you uh, in some services. That's not what that's talking about. That's talking about the Word of God, the water of the Word of God. And I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. And will I cleanse you? A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. That's the promise of God. That is, that is the thing that helps us to understand, to realize, you know what? Yeah, God established this from the very beginning. The moral word of God written on our heart. When Jesus was evangelizing, he used the law. When he was bringing people to himself, when he was saving souls, he used the Old Testament law to do it. Jesus told the rich young ruler to keep the law. And that rich young ruler said, oh, I've done all of that. I kept the law. Oh, really? He said, all right. Well, if that's the case, then go sell all you have and follow me. Back to Exodus chapter number 20 and verse number 3. Who would argue? Who in the world? Who, who would? And you know what? Some people would. Some people would argue that, that, that this law is not on the books today. Who in the world would argue that this is not on the books today? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Really? Do you really think that, 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 that the Ten Commandments don't apply? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. God is saying, you shall not have any other gods. Not in your mind, listen to me. Not in your mind. Not in your heart. Not in your hand. Not in your pocket. Not around your neck as in a necklace. Not in your house. Not in your family. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Not in your driveway. Not on the boat dock. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Before me, in my presence, in my sight. Now God is omniscient. God is also omnipotent. He is omnipresent. Having said that, before me, in my presence, in my sight, that means no matter where, no matter when, 24-7, you can't get away from God. In other words, you can never have put something before God. You say, well, I go to church on Sunday. Yes, but Monday morning, you can't put anything before God. Well, I go to church whenever the church doors are open. Great. But when you're not in church, there is nothing that is supposed to come before God. In other words, this is supposed to be a way of life. This is, the way, this is supposed to be the way that we live. So verse number three pertains to the daily lifestyle of every believer. 24-7 here, no greater love than that for God. There is to be no greater allegiance than that for God. We are to hate our father, hate our mother, hate our brother, hate our children, hate your own life, or you cannot be my disciple. You're supposed to hate your own life, or you cannot be God's disciple. That's serious. You know, when somebody that you love turns their back on you. That's hard. When somebody you love all of a sudden stops living the way that you were all taught to live in your family. Jesus was calling for the fulfillment of the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. A New Testament church will still use the law of God. But like it says in 1 Timothy, we will use it lawfully. And in 2 Timothy, the only other time you find the word lawfully in Scripture, and if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. 
All right, so we're going to use the Word of God. We're going to go back to the Old Testament. We're going to go back and let, and, and let this, this whole thought process, the fact that God would separate His people, the fact that He would pull them aside, that He would send them to the base of a mountain, that He would send fire down on the mountain, that He would get their attention in such a way as to drive home the point that He is holy. Now, Christian, that's exactly what we need to do in our understanding. You don't necessarily have to go to Sinai, the, you know, when, when you get saved, praise the Lord, we're going to the cross. But to help us understand, to help us truly understand what it means that God loves us, to help us truly understand what it means that, that God left all and, and that he loved us so much. For God so loved the world. It's not just that he loved the world. But he so loved the world. God is using words, those words that, he has, uh, that, that come from his very mouth that explain that his love is so great. His love was so, was, was, was so uh, awesome and it was so hard for him. We think, man, I, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, we think love ought to be something that's easy. Well, sure, it's easy to love if somebody loves me and that's why the world falls apart and there are people that have been married three, four, five, six times. You go to your favorite movie star, no matter who they are, and, 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 and they've, they've probably been married three or four times. That's probably the average. The average might even be higher. It wouldn't surprise me. But the whole Hollywood scene is absolutely full of, of sin and adultery and fornication and the whole thing. And God says, listen, if you are friends with that, you are not friends with me. So he says, be careful, because you're never going to see that reading novels. You're, you're not even going to see that reading Christian novels. You're only going to understand God's love for you and how great it was and how deep it was and how hard it was for him by reading the Bible, understanding just how holy he is. I don't think that I even did near justice this morning. But God needs to take us from where we are to where he wants us to be. Amen. And, and we're not going to get there unless we see and understand the difference between where I am and where God is. That, that ought to literally be, it ought to be something that, that creates wonder. Wonder produces worship. Heavenly Father, Lord, help us to be in awe over your majesty, as we heard about in Sunday school this morning. Your majesty, Lord, how great it is. How truly marvelous, Lord, it is. Lord, we, we can't help but, Lord, when we stop and think, about what it means that you died for us. Lord, we're, we're, we're never going to get there. Spiritually, we're never going to get there, Lord, with words that man might write. We have to go back to the Bible. We have to be thankful, Lord, for what you've accomplished, for what you did, how you loved us. Lord, we need to, to, to know that, Lord, better than we, than we do. Forgive us, help us, remind us. Love us. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your kindness, Lord, as it's your, your kindness, it's your goodness that leads us to repentance. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.